Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina Shar, and my guest today is Jonathan Tallow from Sweden. Hello, welcome. Hi, <laughs> thank um, you very much. So you've met on Instagram like a long while ago, basically. So you, yeah. you've been knitting since 2015? Something yeah, like that's that. correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. How did knitting come into your life? Uh, it was a friend of mine, actually. You know, I want, always want to work with my hands. Uh, so when I was in front of the TV before or watching a movie or some series, I usually sat with my mobile phone, you know, like normal people do. <laughs> my friend noticed that and she was like, yeah, you should do something more productive. And I always want to be productive. I'm trying to be creative in drawing and everything, but it's kind of too big, you know, when you have a uh, painting and you want to paint, you always have this vision and you can do whatever you want. And with knitting, it's more like you can do knits and pearls, and then you can do some things in between, but knits and pearls. So it's more, more simple for me to be creative. So she gave me a pair of needles and some, some yarn. She had some acrylic yarn, and I just went for it. I tried my, um, you know, from um, school, uh, that way learned from, from school, and I tried that one. Uh, and I just did some knits and pearls, and it ended up being a, a little bit of flag. I actually have it here. This is oh, my first piece. Oh, that's so pretty. That's so cute <laughs> yeah. that you still have it, was, it. Actually, almost like six years ago now. So it was five months. Uh, so for the, first, like, for the first project, it's like perfect tension and everything. Um, it's not. Uh, when you have it this <laughs> way, it's okay. But closer up, it's not. But it was actually pretty good. Uh, so I still have it with me. And then I went and bought um, a pair of uh, sock needles. What's called double edge? Yeah, I usually do double edge. Yeah, yeah. And then I bought a pattern for some gloves, but I never finished the gloves. I just started doing something else. But that's how it all started. So she showed me and then I just went for it. And I, when I go into something, I go in 100%. So uh, <laughs> then I've been knitting for a while, <laughs> almost every day. Mm -hmm. So um, you are a doctor. Yes. A surgeon. Yes. <laughs> that implies to me that you like busy at work usually. How, yeah, do, you, I, uh, how do you find time to like knit on top of it uh, i you know it's everyone needs something to keep them relaxed or keep the stress off so uh, what i do is i watch a lot of movies or a lot of series and since i then can add the knitting to that i can also be productive at the same time so it's both relaxing and being productive at the same time so it's not that i work all the time uh, in sweden we have you know is it work hours? So of course I'm a little bit tired when I get home from work because it's a lot and I work more than full time, but I want the knitting to, to come into my life and I give room for that because it's such a stress relief for me uh, to knit. Do you ever knit in the hospital, like between the patients? I did before sometimes, <laughs> but uh, no time anymore, no. When I worked night shifts before, sometimes during night, you know, between two and four o'clock uh, or maybe two and five, it could be a little bit more uh, cool down, not too many patients, yeah. Uh, but then again, if you want to keep a good knitting tension, you should not be knitting between two and five. So <laughs> right. I, I give that, that up. Do people at work know that you're a knitter? Yeah. Is, is that like a conversation starter? Yeah. But mostly people know me from my baking because I, I bake as well and I bring that stuff to work and then everyone notices it and, and the, the word spreads, you know. Uh, so they also know that I'm a knitter, but it's more common that they comment on my cakes. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Uh, okay. When I look at your account, we're not talking mm -hmm. about like little brownies kind of thing. We're talking mm -hmm. like elaborate, very sophisticated cakes with like these incredible decorations. How did that start and how did you got, got so passionate about it? I don't know. I just love sweets. I just had an apple cake, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can eat sweets any day. So I, I always love baking also. And at some point, at some point it came to that, you know, we want to be more creative as well with my baking. And it's a perfect way to use cakes as a sort of being baking as well as being very creative because you can do a lot of different designs and play with the color. You can play with structure uh, and also with the fillings, of course. So. I think, and everyone loves a cake. Uh, oh, so, I, yeah. So, especially those you know, good looking cakes. So, you're increasing more and more and trying to push myself to make it even cooler looking. Do you think it's part of your personality, like that 
sort of push yourself more and more because like I'm looking at your knitting and you don't do simple knitting. I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. like sophisticated brioche right away from get go. What, yeah. Is that the same with cakes that you like have to push yourself mm -hmm. and see where the limit is? Mm -hmm. I always try something new. I, I, I Before I never knit the same thing twice. I've seen people doing the same sweater in twice or in different colors. I just, once I'm done with one uh, pattern before when I didn't design myself, I did it once and then I went on to something uh, more uh, challenging. Right. You know, that's, and then I find the brioche, I find it on Instagram actually. Uh, I was looking at some scrolling down, you see some knitters, in, in knitters, influencers showing off their work. And I thought it was looking so cool, but also very difficult. And that's why I found it very uh, interesting. So I started with two needles and going with brioche, and then I started increasing and decreasing, and then you could just see them. Uh, design coming up so right did like you find like when you first were learning how to brioche did you find that difficult at all or was it easy for you yes no very difficult <laughs> <laughs> no because like i'll tell you why i asked because when i learned brioche like i it was the same thing i saw somebody uh with the brioche scarf on instagram and i was like oh my god like this is so cool i have to try it right and then i started trying it i found some uh video on youtube that mm -hmm the tutorial and I started mm -hmm. trying it and it took me 18 tries mm -hmm. to actually like get it because I couldn't mm -hmm. figure out how to fix my mistakes and I would like forget what row I'm on and I would have to undo the whole thing so I would like mm -hmm. get to like one third of the scarf and like frog it you know and then 18 times like this until I finally got the idea of how to deal with it yeah that is the biggest problem going back uh, it's easier usually to go back than to fix try to fix your mistake Right. Uh, so I have also done a lot of trial and errors. <laughs> so, okay, let's talk a little bit about how you got into the design part of it, because it's mm -hmm. one thing when you, you know, need a mm -hmm. scarf for your friend, mm -hmm. a whole other thing when you're like, you know what, from today on, I'm a designer. How did this mm -hmm. decision came to you? Um... Good question. I started off with, I was knitting my, my first brioche hat uh, from a um, designer I find on Instagram that was looking for test knitters. Mm -hmm. So I started test knitting for her and then I can see a little bit how more lay, different kind of layouts of design. And I thought that I want to also try to make my own layout of something that I made. So first I tried to make some brioche and I ended up being a, a hat and uh, that I did because it's you know a simpler piece you don't have to do so big right. uh, so I made the, the helix brioche hat I said it was my first design so I made that one uh, and I thought maybe I can put this down in a, on a paper and give it to someone else and see what, if they can make it as well and uh, so I put a lot of effort down in making this pattern hat. pdf right. yeah uh, and it was so well welcomed uh, I gave it up for free in Swedish first and then I got tons of mail on the first week saying that please can you can you translate this to English I can help you I can do whatever you want uh, just we just want this on English as well so I sat down and I made it also in English and it was also very well received so uh, I just enjoyed uh, that people liked what I was doing so from that day on I always tried to make some more from my ideas because I have a lot of ideas in my head you know you can see all the uh, shawls around me right here that I just came to me and also have like 10 different ideas in my head and just fun it's fun to first of all to knit something that you made yourself but also share it with someone else so that's why I design I don't design to make money I, I design because I like to see that people uh, can make it and also they enjoy making it and also enjoy their final product as well right. uh, do you did you ever find it difficult like the business part of it the marketing part of it yeah it is uh, but since i ravelry has been easy for me <laughs> it's easy because you can just post it there and then, then someone picks it up and share with them friends in their um, knitting group uh, so it could be for uh, you could be luck that you have a, a pattern that is well received because if they see it and they spread it then you pop up in the in the uh, in the rankings of rivalry of course but it's in my first pattern was free it also could be spread uh, more so i can see there's thousands of downloads but there's not thousands of hats made because people can just download it and see and right. and then and maybe use some of there for their own designs but uh yeah 
how does it feel when you see like another person who you don't know make, mm -hmm. making your designs? Proud. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a feel of joy. <laughs> you can see I'm almost blushing because <laughs> I didn't think that I would actually have someone that I didn't know make something that I've made uh, the, from the pattern. Right. Uh, so when I see it pops up of Instagram, people using the hashtag of made by Tolo or uh, the actual design of anything like the Helix brush hat, uh, it just warms my heart. I saw this um, reel of yours recently mm -hmm. where apparently you just like swatching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that mm -hmm. like a general? Because I mean, I'll swatch if I if I absolutely must. And I've mm -hmm. been just knitting so much like in the past year that I sort of like it became a necessity to swatch just because it's part of the test knitting. But I'll avoid it any way I can, if I can. Do you feel mm -hmm. the same way? Like, and why? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I'm, um, uh, let's say that maybe if you design something, I, I want to see how it looks like. Uh, I, I still haven't really figured out uh, designing in, in uh, what's it called? How the finished part would look. I have a little bit problem with that still. Uh, so I just want to keep going and do the finished product and then see how it looks. So I have trouble with doing a small swatch and seeing how it will turn out. But sometimes I start and I feel the colors are all wrong or it doesn't really work out with the, the structure of something. So then I spend hours of doing something that I really must rip up. Uh, instead of just trying to do a small swatch to see what it looks like and then write the colors are bad. Let's not do it like this. Uh, so I do dislike swatching because I think that uh, it's boring, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, but I should be doing it more because it saves me time, at least when I'm designing. When I'm swatching for sweaters, or I mean, when I'm doing sweaters, I always swatch because I'm um, terrible at keeping knit intention. So I need, always need to do, I'm, I'm a loose knitter, so I need to uh, go down a needle size or two. Uh, anyway, so it's bad to make a sw uh, sweater that you can't fit in. <laughs> it's fine. You know what? Like I was interviewing two people from Shetland that was uh, Alison Randall who said it first and then Hazel Tyndall said the same exact thing they were like we don't swatch and if we need to swatch for a sweater we just mm -hmm. make it a hat or or mittens or something mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm, they, they, they said that they find swatching mm -hmm. wasteful not only time but yarn wise right yes and i love that because i'm using it now <laughs> as an excuse of why i don't want to switch yeah. so i'm like yeah. excusing my laziness mm -hmm. with the fact that it's just wasteful of yarn you know yes that is actually <laughs> also one one reason that i won't swatch because when i swatch i do the swatch and then i don't cut the yarn and and block it i just try to measure and then i uh, rather unravel it so i can <laughs> right. keep the yarn <laughs> yes right right <laughs> No, I feel the same way. Like, I'm like, why would I have this? And what I'm going to do with this perfect swatch, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can use this yarn for the actual product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned that you have a bunch of ideas. Mm -hmm. How do those ideas appear? Like, do you dream of them? Do you walk outside and you see somebody wearing something and you think, oh, I can make it mm -hmm. into something like that? Like, where are your inspirations come from? from every, everywhere actually and you can see some of my design has been a little bit more simple and some has been more like i love geometric shapes uh like uh, the ones i'm having here it's more like a star with simple boxes it just makes this geometric shape and also the the one i'm having here with a little like a star right. as well so i keep i get inspiration from from shapes uh but also from just um uh, recently, I started to get inspiration also from yarn because before that, I, I always had this store bought yarn uh, that, I, that I had in, in bunches or in hoops. Now I try to get more of um, in the dyer hand dyed yarns. Mm -hmm. I get inspiration from that as well. Like, what is this going to be? I can almost see it. Uh, but mostly, it just could be anything. I can be watching a movie and see something that's cool or just been knitting on something. And I, I feel like, ah, oh, while I'm knitting, maybe I should do like this next time. That could look cool. Uh, and then I have a little notebook where I type it down and I'll try that one next time. So you mentioned the indie dyers. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're getting into the indie dyed yarn because of the Instagram? Because you see so many mm -hmm. like super talented people there? Yes. yes. 
it started with that. It started with someone like showing me off some some cool friend that was dying yarn, and then just went on and on. And then I had uh, my followers on Instagram are amazing. So sometimes I do some polls and I ask like, what is your favorite uh, yarn in the dyers or store bought? And then I get tons of, of replies. And so we have a little um, list now that I'm trying to work from and buying some yarn from from everyone of their of their favorites, of my followers' favorites, so I can use some of the yarn and see if I can find also new favorites. Right. What's mm -hmm. your yarn stash looks like? Are we talking small. like I really Very small? Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, like I, I think <laughs> like ten skeins right now. Oh seriously, yeah. you are the it most has... uh, small yarn stash. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> Buy more. <laughs> no, I don't know what happened. I think I've been a little bit like I need to use what I have uh, because I also have gotten some yarns from some some indie designers or in the in the dyers, and I want to use them so they can know that it, when they give me some yarn, I will use that in the design as right. well. So I don't want to buy more and not use the yarns I already have. So I'm going to be using those, and then maybe I'll buy some more. <laughs> right. Um. So I know you bake, but I also saw you cook. Mm -hmm. And it's back to the same question of you being very competitive about what you do, but you don't just like slap a sandwich together. We're talking about like eight hours uh, bolognese. Yes. Like <laughs> working you on. <laughs> but when I have time, of course, I I still do uh, you know ten minute bolognese sometimes. <laughs> but still, yeah, I do enjoy cooking. It's also a way of stress relief. You just you still need to make food, you know. And you can make food in, in so many different ways. And sometimes I make dif um, difficult food because I enjoy food as well. And sometimes I make, I make it simple. So it's a matter of time, really, and inspiration. Right. The same with sometimes I make the simple chocolate cake, you know, and sometimes I make, you know, these huge cool cakes uh, with different kind of layers and colors and, and structures and everything. And I also started recently making chocolates. Then you know chocolate and bonbons. Those, those are like so amazing. Mm -hmm. like I would like <laughs> definitely buy a whole bunch. I'm sort of glad in the way that like you far because otherwise, you know, like I see yeah. a lot of cakes and bolognese and uh, chocolates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's, an, that's a new uh, thing that I started with. So that also is a way to, it's also kind of within boundaries. You can't do anything with chocolate. So it's kind of what I need to do. I need to have boundaries of what I can do. Because if it gets too big, like a, like a painting, like an aquarelle painting or everything, I, I can't do it. So I needs to be within boundaries. And chocolate is, you need to have separate, certain temperatures. It's, it's very specific. Uh, but then you can work with colors, of course, and, and with fillings. But that's also a little bit within boundaries. So uh, it's kind of my thing. <laughs> but to me, it's interesting. Because to me, the baking or chocolate mm -hmm. making it's it's very like scientific because you need to measure exactly it's almost like chemistry experiment right whereas cooking it's more like just take a handful of this and put a pinch of that like it's more sort of improvisational mm -hmm. um do you have if, like one that you prefer over another or like why do you enjoy both mm. I enjoy both because they are different. I think sometimes you want to make, you know, uh, you want to be inspired and just try to, I need a little bit of that, a little, little bit of this, a little bit of that when you're cooking. And with baking, you can do that as well in, in um, uh, but within boundaries again then, because you can't to take too much flour, you can't take too much uh, sugar because it would end up not tasting as good or you're not getting the same structure as it was supposed to. But then you can change otherwise with, with fillings. If you do a cake exactly, you can do different fillings and different kind of textures in that. You can try um, making a panna cotta once and then you can make some good new cream the next time or make a whipped cream or a, um, um, like a meringue, meringue buttercream. Uh, so you can change it up every time. So you don't have to be all within the boundaries, but it is more, like you said, it needs to be specific measurements and more scientific with chocolate and baking than in, with cooking. But I enjoy You're making both. me very hungry, by the way. I just say <laughs> <laughs> this, this fiber chat's making me hungry. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, hungry. I also noticed that so you do watercolor and painting, but you also do calligraphy, and it's sort of the same dynamic because calligraphy is like so precise, and you have to mm -hmm. be so in control. Whereas mm -hmm. the watercolor, you just have to let the colors melt into each other. So you have that like going on through 
your art, you know, artistic mm -hmm. side, basically in many areas of your life. How is mm -hmm. it translates into knitting? Do you have the same thing in knitting? Mm, I like calligraphy a lot more than uh, what I call it painting <laughs> because it's more, you know, fine lines. Uh, so I always use inspiration from anything. So right now it's not been too much uh, painting for me or calligraphy, it's just been a lot of knitting, but I always try to keep inspiration from all of the creative ideas that I have in my head. So uh, right now it's a little bit less of uh, the artsy stuff with painting uh, and a little bit more with knitting and then you can switch back someday, we'll see. Right. And then, so you posted a lot of pictures of your son and congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. He's like so adorable. I love yes. seeing pictures of him, especially <laughs> that like the shawl where he runs with yeah, the yeah. West shawl. He's in, I mean. he's in, uh, this one that I recently made is like, try it, try it, try it, please try it, please try it. <laughs> so he wants to try that as well. So he's been running around here. Not outside yet. It's not right. No, I mean, I definitely <laughs> think Stephen West should use that picture as his like cover for that show because he couldn't get cuter model. <laughs> <laughs> and he also bakes now. Yes. So <laughs> I have to introduce him to my crafts, you know. Right. So, do you find he like? Do you see introducing him to knitting as well at some mm -hmm. point? Of course. I'm trying to may learn how to crochet a chain stitch or a chain. Uh, didn't work out, but uh, it's going to get another try one other day. Right. He's still yes. young for that. <laughs> yes. yes. Do you do a lot of artsy things or like creative things with him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of paintings, uh, baking, uh, every, all, everything creative. It's part of our life. And then your designs also became like he became part of your mm -hmm. designs because you're making now stuff for children. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A little bit. I made a hat when we met, uh, when, when we got him, he's adopted, right? So we, we came to us in November, so it's almost a year now. So when we were waiting for him, I needed a sweater that was uh, from Tin Can Knits, a uh, very popular sweater. So I made that one and then I just had some yarn left because I bought a lot of yarn. Uh, so I tried like, we, when we're going to go home, we're going to have cold weather because in Sweden it's very cold. Right. Uh, so it was like making a hat for him and then I tried different designs and then when I got that is when I came up with um, uh, what now I forgot the name the Dahlia uh, hat uh, that I love it's so cool I didn't I just tried different stitches and it ended up being so cool so <laughs> that's one that one he's been using all winter and also I made uh, the highway hat also for him uh, so it's been yeah trying to find something before I just made hats for for men and women adult you know right. and now it's been uh, my life has been upside down since november so also my designs has been going all around so well it's good upside oh. down though right mm -hmm. yes yes <laughs> <laughs> but my knitting has been getting a little bit less attention you know uh for good reasons right mm -hmm. i saw also that you were like playing with amigurumi like the crochet toys um mm -hmm. Bef before you adopted your son, is it still mm -hmm. part of your, like, do you make toys for him now? Mm, I've made some food, uh, like uh, crochet some pancakes and eggs and meatballs and spaghetti, but he's not playing with it. <laughs> <laughs> I spent hours on that. You know, his attention uh, spans, it switches things all the time, but they still have his uh, crochet food. It's funny because like with kids, they so unpredictable. They, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you can make something like so elaborate and they don't care mm -hmm. about it, but then they see something super simple and they like all over it. So mm -hmm. it's hard to predict what people will yeah. like. Yeah. yeah, I was loving it at first, but it was like two days and then he found some cars that was more fun. Right. So he still plays with it when he's going to make food, but that's not what he's into right now. It's more cars. What happens with uh, things you need? Do you wear everything you need? Do you give it as gifts? Like what happens to the majority of your needs? It's been different. I've been selling some of my designs, uh, some shawls and some hats I made, and to friends. And I'm giving also away as gifts. But as you can see, I'm still surrounded by <laughs> my stuff that I've made. Uh, I made a lot of um, you know small toys, uh, amigurumis, uh, crochet, that I'm going to give to uh, our local uh, hospital. Uh, to the children's care unit there for kids with diabetes uh, that they can give, get from learning how to uh, inject themselves with insulin. Right. Uh, so also trying to give something back. 
That's you know. so nice, actually. That's a great idea how to use those toys. Yes. I'm sure they would love it. It's lying in the bag here anyway. So. <laughs> And I wanted, that was also one of my inspiration. I made like one or two for myself. And then a, then a friend told me that you can give gift away those toys. So then I made like 20 just to have those uh, to give away. Right. That, mm -hmm. That's so nice, actually. Um, you mentioned that you're not very good with anything in, that has yeast in it, like bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that you like everybody who knows you knows that you like hopeless at bread and by the yes. way i have the same thing with rice like i can cook pretty much anything but like every time i make rice it just turns uh -huh. into this goop somehow i don't like i don't know and i've tried like all different recipes and you would think that rice is the easiest but somehow i managed to screw it up all the time okay. um do you do you feel like you are a perfectionist in everything you do like does it bother you when you bad at something like making bread and how do you deal with that side uh usually when i was younger i just didn't do it what i was bad at i did was just i just stopped uh, i was um you know i was canoeing when i was young uh, in a canoeing club and now they always everyone started competing and i started competing as well but i was so bad so i just stopped i just stopped competing it was no idea because i i thought that if i can't win it's no idea to to do it you know uh, but now I learned how to be more like try to push myself, as we talked about before. Uh, when I can't do it, I just try again and try again and try again. Because if I want to learn it, I, I can do it, you know. Uh, so what I did with G spread, <laughs> it's one thing I practiced, and it's better now. But I still, I still, it's still very unpredictable. I think with with G, sometimes it just puffs up really nice, and sometimes it's a <laughs> so. I rather do something that you know I can succeed with almost every time. Right. But you know, you you, you not always will you succeed with anything you do. So you can be a professional at at your at knitting or at your work or anything and could still mess up. Uh, so everyone needs to be on their toes, even if you are comfortable with something. How do you deal with like moments of doubt, or how do you deal with like times when? you build the reputation that you are a designer and people expect or you think you people expect certain things from you and you just like don't have an idea or don't have an inspiration or you're just not happy with what you're doing how do you deal with that mm -hmm. yeah so i i had a moment of doubt i think it was like one year ago i haven't uh, hadn't um, released any new patterns and i was like why did i even start designing because now I feel the pressure that I need to do something that I can also present as a pattern. I can't really just knit something from another designer uh, because then it looks like I'm not doing what people expect me to do. Uh, but then I decided that like, I'm not doing this for a living. I just do this for, for fun. Uh, and I'm also like some of the money I get, I always um, donate as well. So it's a part of me to, to give back. And I also think that uh, designing has given me opportunity to meet new people because people reach out to me in a different way than when I was just knitting for myself. So I've had lots of doubts, but I just uh, it's okay to have doubt, you know, and you, you're supposed to, you, you can just um, go through it and just start with uh, doing something else and, and leave that behind and then it will, it will come back to you, uh, your inspiration uh, or your uh, feeling of joy of knitting. Like you said, I heard you're talking about fiber chats about the knitting block or inspirational block. Sometimes you just have to leave the work you're doing aside and start something new, and then you can go back to it later with more inspiration. Right. Do you think it's all self-imposed? Do you think like people actually sit at home and wait for you, let's say, to design something? Or do you think it's all... Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably in my head, yes. <laughs> Some has been asking, like, what well, I haven't seen you in a while, what are you doing? Uh, but I think that's not because they want to see me designing more. It's just because they, they're like, want to, they think that they, people think that they know me a little bit from Instagram. You know, I've been posting up about me, about my kid, about my designing. And then it's not been anything for a month. And people are like, hmm, what happened to this guy? Is he okay? Uh, so it's more like being nice than, than putting pressure on me. Uh, I think. Do you, but do you feel pressured? Like, do you feel like you're putting yourself under bit, pressure? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, but I, I, that was part of when I started designing. I, it was part of it as well because I didn't get all nice reviews from my hat. Some thought that uh, like the Helix brush hat. Some thought it was 
um, the pattern was hard to read and and stuff like that and it came to me you know it's not uh, harsh critics but it's still a little critic and you have to learn to uh, to accept that so, like you talked about the first thumbs down on instagram uh, <laughs> i know i'm still i'm still traumatized not, about that one <laughs> you're not always like what you do you know right uh, so, no, it's funny, it's funny because it's like I, I've been thinking a lot about it lately and how much of it like we self-impose and how much of it is actual expectation. And I feel like the more I talk to talk about it, the more I come to realize that like I'm stressing over knitting, you know, I'm, and, I, and it's like you have to remind yourself that you started doing it to get away from stress you started yeah, yeah. doing it because you wanted right. something yeah yeah i agree i it's like like i said last year when i had this uh, block as well i i just had to put knitting down for a while uh, because it was too stressful uh, i i wanted to produce and i, I kept on knitting and knitting and knitting and unless like i said i can't swatch so i made some new design i think this will look cool and it ended up looking really goofy so i had to pull everything up and, you, and then you know you spent hours doing something that you can't show anyone and because when i show a small piece as well i expect that people want to want to see the full piece and right. so sometimes i have to knit a little bit to see that this can be something and then i post uh, a picture that i maybe took in the beginning uh, because i want to show the small piece and then it goes bigger and bigger because that also looks um, better on Instagram, of course, but also it's what, what happens in my head. Uh, but if I do something small, then it turns out that I frogged it, it will look pretty bad. It's funny because I had this one time when I was uh, test knitting for mm -hmm. Julie Knits in Paris, it was a sweater and it was a new technique to me. So I had to do brioche in, in the round, uh, it was like complicated this magic loop like it was like something whatever so it was like all new to me at that point and i was so concentrating on the brioche part of it that mm -hmm. i just screwed up something like extremely simple so i ended up knitting the whole entire day and then i had to like undo the whole thing and it wasn't because of the difficult part of the brioche it was like some simple mistake that i just like completely sort of overlooked mm -hmm. right and I was complaining about it to a friend of mine, Jack Strabell. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I just wasted the whole day. I was knitting so much. And I was like, I thought I was so good because I got this brioche in the round. And now I'm like, I have to undo it. And he's like, well, I'm hearing that you've been knitting all day. So it's good, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's all on the how you look at it. You know, you can look at it that it was like so much waste of time. Or you can look at it, you got to knit all day, you know, so. How bad is that? <laughs> I've been using that as well, because when you do some shawls, uh, you can, you learn construction as well. Uh, when you knit and you find out that this didn't work, but then you can use that that didn't work for something else. Uh, right. Because you learn how, how construction works with increases and decreases in different ways. So I've also been using bad days of knitting as uh, in good ways. Yeah. You know, you want to show something also to, to your followers and and to yourself because you want to do this because you want it to be productive as well not only because you wanted to to keep rolling your hands so uh, it's, it's both good and bad do you feel like you're still learning something new every day about knitting mm, yeah well, not, not every day but yeah a lot because there's so many techniques you know i'm, I'm into brioche and even though i'm into brioche i learn something new every day uh, or not every day but uh, often and then when you try something new, you learn some new techniques about something else. So like you said, you do a lot of lace knitting. I've never knitted lace. Uh, so maybe I'll try that someday as well. And then I can also hey, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> improve a lot in my knitting. Yes, not at least only brioche. But right now it's just, I love the feel of the thick fabric of brioche. So I will keep on knitting that for a while. Maybe I'll incorporate like an incorporated double knitting in my, in my highway hat. Maybe I'll incorporate something with lace and some other brioche design. Yeah, it's actually like a great idea to have like sections of brioche and sections mm -hmm. of lace. It always mm -hmm. makes it like interesting texturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are you working on now? And like, what's your plans for the rest of this year? Mm -hmm. I have, I'm have. i working on nothing right now. It's crazy. <laughs> I just finished this one uh, that I haven't blocked. Can you show yet. it yes. Yeah, yes, I can. It's, it's not even have its name yet, but it's... I had this idea of, of uh, brioche going into each other and I wanted to make a, a semi-circle show. Uh, so this one I made recently, and just, I just finished today actually that uh, weaving in the ends. 
it's always bad it's when like there's so many colors. It's perfect for the whole because it has all the fall colors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm going to block this out because I, I, like, I like when brioche is really stretched. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to block it out and see what it looks like. But this one is just off the needles. Uh, but then I have so many shawls that I haven't written the pattern for, like this one. It's been done since uh, before we went to, to Colombia. And also this one was from last summer. So I have three shawls now. <laughs> and I'm also working on some ideas for um, uh, advent, uh, and what's called, you know, the calendar. Uh, advent, advent calendars, advent. yes. <laughs> so with mini skeins. So I have made actually one shawl that I, kind of, that I cannot show you right now, but ah. I'm also making another one, so. That's so interesting because I'm getting mm -hmm. first, first advent this year that I mm -hmm. ordered and I'm actually very excited about it. So I might mm -hmm. use your pattern for that then. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite part of the designing process and what's your least favorite part of the designing process as you can see i have three unknitted on uh, the um, written patterns here you can see i love knitting way more than, than <laughs> actually writing it down but it's also i think it's fun i just need to have time for it and right now i haven't really had time for it because i it's hard to write the pattern in front of the tv uh, and it's just been i had to had have, have some uh, you know really quiet time just sitting in front of the tv uh, because it's been a lot of stress uh, so i'm going to go back to uh, to writing soon and i'm going to take i love the whole idea by writing a pattern because it's not just writing it down it's also layout and photo uh, like and trying to make it um, simple to read but still easy to uh, simple to read and understand but still look good so it's um, more than just writing what you've done down. So I like that as well, but it takes a lot of time. It's a lot of work down in, in the pattern uh, writing. So when you need it, right, before you start writing the pattern, do you take like very detailed notes? Like how do you remember what you did in those shows that mm -hmm. you finished? I have uh, in my sofa, I have my computer besides me. So I'm like looking at the TV on the, on the series or movie and I'm knitting and I'm also writing the pattern. Uh, on the side, I'm mean, not the whole pattern, of course, but uh, what I, if I do some specific rows that it's difficult, I always write it down. Uh, and I also have the, the knitting tension and everything, write it down. So I, if I move on to something else, I still have uh, remember what I did, what, what I've done. So I have um, most of the patterns of these three are done. Right. It's just that I haven't finished them yet. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a matter of like putting it in the final form. Yeah, basically. yeah it is. And you need to take it, edit it, and you need to have test meters that needs it, and then you get all the, um, uh, you know, you get some response back on what they sh they want you to, to fix and change, and then you have to do that one as well and send it out. So it's uh, once you send it out for test meeting, it just needs to be almost completely done, and then you have to uh, fix and edit it as well. Uh, so I did that a lot when I was uh, home with my son uh, because there was more time then in some way, because now uh, every waking hour when he's, uh, um, every hour that he's awake, I want to spend with him since I'm also working a lot. Right. Uh, so it's been way less time for, for um, writing patterns right now, but it, it will come, it will come. Right. What in your opinion makes a good test meter? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I, I always try to find new ones. I have some that uh, comes back to me every time and it for me, and I love that. Because I, then they um, uh, know a little bit of what I what I what I want what I want from them. At the at law also, um, I know that they will finish in time. But sometimes, you know, when you have the same test knitters, uh, they can't really see some problems because they're so used to how you're normally writing your patterns. Mm -hmm. So it's always good to have some new ones that can come with new eyes and look and see like uh, your. Um, this layout is wrong or, or looks weird and it's hard to follow what you're thinking about so uh, test needers should have they should have time of course uh, and they they should reply to you on your uh, notes what you want to have them replying to like uh, uh, like yardage of course as well as some notes in the pattern but usually i, I always like when test needers have fun so if you want to make a product, then then you can just test it. And if you don't have time to make it in time, it's okay. If you don't have all the tools you need, it's okay. So uh, I just think that with all my designs, you should have fun knitting them. So if you feel pressure and you, you don't think it's fun because you don't feel you have time for it, then just put it down and do it some time else. So 
So I always send out all my patterns, finished patterns to everyone that has been test knitting, even though they didn't finish. Uh, so I have no like uh, um, grudge on that. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, do you ever, are you ever surprised by like the color choices that your testers pick? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. I'm usually pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I'm like, why didn't I think of that? You know? <laughs> I end with my test knitters. I've, some test knitters are really cool. They have like this huge yarn stash. And I'm like, I have these three colors I can switch from. So yeah, I'm always impressed. And sometimes I want to use their picture for my, my, uh, you know, my, my pattern, but I still want to use my pictures, of course. But uh, sometimes it's really cool to see some new, new photos of uh, other colors or other construction, they change a little bit of the border, change a little bit of um, some color sections. It's so cool. Does it uh, so bother you when people change your design, like customize no, your no, design? No, 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 no. Uh, it's, if it's small changes, it's always good to, to see that also in, in, in um, yardage. So I don't mind. And like th this one, I have like two colors used for, for this section as well, this section and this section and then two colors for the other sections. But I wouldn't mind if people used other colors for everything or just the same color for everything. Right. Uh, doesn't need to, as long as I can still figure out the yardage. So I don't, I'm not bothered at all. Right. Knitting is fun, you know, you're supposed to have fun. And if your creative side is to make something else with my ideas, then go for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's funny because like I, I found like a few times when I was um, knitting somebody's shawls, mm -hmm. I would just make them much larger somehow because mm -hmm. i mean i'm a very loose knitter also but i also like like the shawl of size of god you know so mm -hmm. oftentimes like i would make something and the designer would be like oh i like yours better than mine you know? yeah. so it's like sometimes it happens that you like you do something and it gives a different look to uh -huh. the original design uh -huh. yes yes yeah, I've had that that moment when you're like liking someone else's uh, ideas of your idea better. But it's also part of the process. You know, you will always have envy someone else in some way. And uh, not only always others design, but also what others make with your design. Okay. So it's also good, you know, because that can be creative or give inspiration to make something else. Right. Like I mean, sometimes you just like you find something new and inspiring mm -hmm. just from seeing what other people do, you know. This yes, is how yes. it's I think Instagram is amazing for that because you can just scroll and see what other people make and, and find inspiration from that one. Right. No, I do that all the time. And I have like a lot of times when I'm working on something, like mm -hmm. when I when I need lace and it's like a large lace project, it takes so much time. Like you can do it for like a month or a few mm -hmm. months even. And it's hard to like plan anything else because you saw mm -hmm into that project that you don't really think about what's next and then you're done and there is this moment of vacuum and you don't really know what to do next and that's when i go on instagram and i just scroll through the feed and then something will pop mm -hmm. up and something will i'm like mm -hmm. oh, i, I want to do this you know <laughs> mm -hmm. i also i also have that moment but right now i have so many ideas that i want to do so when i'm done with something I'm like next 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 uh, someone tried out well, I can't wait to see what you're going to do next, what you're going to come up with. Yeah, I, I need to make a sweater. I need to make a, a cardigan or somehow. So I'm going to do that. Also in brioche, of course. I'm still not leaving brioche, even though I want to try lace and, and other stuff. <laughs> brioche in my heart. <laughs> Let me ask you last, one last question, actually, yeah. about cardigan. So huh? how do you learn how to like grade for for sizes how do you learn how to like make it fit all different body types like are you afraid of that are you scared of yes. so how you approach yeah that? i don't know i don't know <laughs> i think i will probably there, there i saw there is a course uh, on the internet about that one being more inclusive about body types and, and sizing so i'm gonna try to maybe take that one as well as read a lot uh, you know because you don't have to invent a wheel every time, you know, you can use what others have made and, and read uh, books about it. Uh, so I'm going to do that, you know, um, I want to do something uh, that really fits, uh, you know, and something that people can use. Uh, so that's also one of the reasons that I actually um, like went into more uh, shawl right, right now, because I don't have the time to, to make fitting uh, or, or make everything fit perfectly. So with shawls, you don't have to make something fit because you can just make construction and then it fits everyone. Uh, but when I go back to maybe doing some other stuff uh, like a cardigan, I need to make sure that it's perfect. 
<laughs> so shorts are more for like um, just go nuts and then hats is also a little bit more simple but i haven't made like socks or or, or sweaters yet so i'll come to that <laughs> oh. Well, hopefully one day I'll finish my pair of socks because somehow, so it was funny because Professor Pearl, who was on my show, gifted me a sock pattern. Mm -hmm. And then I was talking to Caleb from Drowning in Yarn about like, because he loves uh, knitting socks. So I was yeah. talking to him about it and I was like, you know what? I have this fear of socks. I don't know, like I've knitted so many things, but like socks somehow terrified me. And then uh -huh. Steven Weber, who was also so like it's all the guys that were um, part of, of Fiber Chat. Uh -huh. Steven Weber was making fun of me by posting a picture of himself knitting socks while watching me and Caleb talk about my sock <laughs> phobia <laughs> on Instagram. And I was like, fine, you know what? I'm knitting socks. So I started uh -huh. the sock that uh, the sock pattern that Professor Pearl knit, uh, gave, gifted me, but somehow uh -huh. I made a mistake somewhere right after the heel part. And uh -huh. it just um, a little bit for a much larger person than any large person I know. <laughs> um, so I have to like undo it and go back and figure it out. So I'm still, I still didn't overcome that one. So socks is still on my phobia, at least at the moment. <laughs> I've only been knitting like simple socks because I have, have had the, you know, second sock syndrome. I can just make one sock and then not the second sock. So when I knit socks, I usually knit them okay. double. You know, yeah, they knit both at the same time on, on a large magic loop. And then you can't do too much uh, uh, color work or, or too much uh, structural work so uh, because otherwise you will just twine up intertwine all the all the yarns right so i may just make simple socks that's what i do <laughs> well maybe one day you and i will become socks professionals maybe, so. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well Hopefully. thank you so very much for being a guest of my fiber chats today thank you i enjoyed yes, it so like i said before we started i'm starstruck by you you have <laughs> Huge community built up around you with both Instagram and the Facebook group that I've been joining and now with Fiber Chats. It's so cool. Thank you. Thank you.